joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire. much more than anything. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire and I long to Savior, I would go where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow. Always where he leads me, I would follow, follow on. Walking in his footsteps till the crown be won. Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus anywhere. Marky for playing. So how do we deal with the service like today? What do we say or more importantly not say? Do we just reminisce over the good times? And you know they've been good times. Or do we preach a gospel message and if anybody was here that needed it, give them one more chance? Should we have had a sing inspiration and, and sing, just sing good songs or a special speaker? So what do we do? Well, thankfully, I had a good counselor to ask. And I believe he gave me what we need to do. Our text is going to be Psalms 119, verse 105. 
Psalms 119, verse 105. But while you're turning, I've been trying to think what Sunday night it was. And I think it was the Sunday night when I said you all could vote on us. We were standing back there, kind of back behind where Mason is sitting. And I was talking about Nehemiah 8.8. 8. And I said, if I'm going to preach and if I'm going to attempt to follow what I believe the Holy Ghost is leading us to do, I want it to be like Nehemiah 8.8. 8. The verse says, so they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and cause them to understand the reading. In my Bible, I've underlined that verse in red, and beside it I've written, quote, if I'm going to preach, let it be like this, end quote. Now, whether or not I've attained that goal, y'all can discuss among yourselves later. But there is simply, there's something about simply using God's word in context, in letter, and in spirit that will lead us along our journey and it'll do it well. And the psalmist surely must have known this, for in verse 105 of Psalms 119, he said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. A lamp for my feet. Light for the present, the current need. It doesn't illuminate anything but where I currently stand. A little pin light just right here. Imagine walking into a cave. Does anybody here do caving, spelunking? Evan, do you crawl back in caves? Can't say I blame you. Ellie went in one this week. I didn't go. They told me how steep it was to get down to it, and I chickened out. I didn't feel like going down wouldn't have been the problem. Coming back would have been the issue. But apparently it was an amazing cave. Waterfalls and a creek that was about chest deep, they said, and said the water was quite cold and really a, a neat cave. But imagine going in a cave and as you're going in, ahead of you is total darkness. You cannot see anything. And so you're going you're gonna to want a light for my feet. Am I going to step in a puddle? Am I going to step off a cliff? Am I going to stub my toe on a stalagmite? Am I going to trip over a sleeping Bigfoot? I mean, what am I fixing to do? And so I want a light right here in front of me. For this step, a light. And the next step, a light. A hundred feet of me is irrelevant. I need a lamp for my feet. And you know, that's the way it's going to be with this congregation in the days and weeks ahead, with or without a pastor. Decisions are going to be made, steps are going to be taken, and then another, and another, and another. What should I do today? Right now. What do I need to do right now? And God's word will be there to guide us and to show us the next step. And so step by step, we've walked into this cave and this cavern, but now turn around. And way back there is the mouth of that cave and a beacon of light that shows our path. Oh, we'll probably still want our steps lit, but the path, the direction, is now lit up. Our long-range goal, our trajectory has been set. That what's on the fringes is now insignificant because there's a light for our path. Again, that's how it's going to be with this church. What is the trajectory, the long-range goals? Well, God's Word will give it to us. He'll show us where we're headed, for good or for bad. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You say, Nathan, is it really that important to know God's word? Last Thursday, a week ago, Heidi's grandpa had COVID, and it had gone, was it double pneumonia? And his lungs, he could not breathe. They needed to put him on a um, respirator, ventilator, and the doctor said, if I put you on that respirator, you will die. I will not be able to take you off. So he was on a bypass machine, and, and Heidi's uncle Jeff told the doctor, he had been Lyle's doctor for many, many years, he said, I need to know what's up. And the doctor said, his lungs are really bad. And Jeff is kind of a black and white, blunt, outspoken fellow, and he said, I know that. I need to know what is the future? Will he get better? And the doctor said, no, he will die in this hospital. He will not go home. 
He said, that's what I needed to know. Well, I was still with it, mind still sharp. And Jeff said, Dad, in just a little while, you're going to be with Jesus. You are dying. He knew it. He knew he was dying. And so on Thursday, he couldn't talk. His lungs were full of whatever, would not work. He could not talk. The family would call. And one by one, all the siblings that couldn't get to the hospital would call, and they used FaceTime, so they were able to look at him and him them and, and talk. And they said his heart rate was running about 50. And when June called, his face lit up and his heart rate doubled, run up to 100. Next month would be 65 years they were married. So he was with it, and he knew he was dying. He knew he was dying. It wasn't an abstract someday. It wasn't a, I'm 10 years old, I'll die in 80 or 90 years business. It was, I'm dying, presently dying. And Heidi's cousin Lee called, and he's a pianist and a good pianist. And, and so he sat at the piano and set the phone right here. And he said, Grandpa, what would you like me to play? And the songbook is full of good songs. But do you know what the first song Grandpa Lyle wanted to hear? Was the B-I-B-L-E. Of all the songs he could have picked, it was the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. And so they sang a while. They sang Victory in Jesus and In the Garden. And Jeff said... Dad could not talk, but he sang. He said, it takes more air to sing than talk. Go figure. How did the old man that couldn't talk sing? And said, the longer he sang, the stronger his voice got. And they sang victory in Jesus, and they sang in the garden. He walks with me, and he talks with me. And the guy is dying and knows it. And Lee told at the funeral, the last thing I heard my grandpa say, the last thing I heard my grandpa say was when they sang, played this song, and he sang, All the way my Savior leads me. Oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed immortal wings his flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. You say, Nathan, is God's word really that important? And on the authority of Scripture and on the, on the testimony of Grandpa Kimball, I say, yes, it is. It is that important. Why is it that important? Paul told Timothy, and I've got lots of references here, so as I turn, you'll have to bear with me. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, he said, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Why is it important? Because it is of divine origin. You see... John chapter 1 tells us that in the beginning, if I can find it, I may just have to quote it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 said, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Why is the Word important? It's of divine origin. It's the same as Jesus. It's the thoughts of God. He gave them to us. You see, there was a time when the word was rare. It wasn't common. It wasn't for all. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1 says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. It was rare. It wasn't like today when there's Bibles. Well, there's Bibles, one right in front of Jack that it looks like was given to a boy in 06, and he never reads it. I mean, they're common. People don't even need to take them home to read them. They've got so many at the house. But although it was rare, it still had value. 
It still had value over in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 8. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And now in verse 10 it said, And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Chapter 23 begins, And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in the book. And all the people stood to the covenant. Although the word was rare, it still had value. And you know, in our day and time, post-Calvary, there is still value to the word. There is still value to the word. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5 and verses, uh, the second part of verse 25 and verse 26, as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he may, might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Post-Calvary, it's the word that leads us to Christ. There's value in it. It helps us. All throughout the Bible, there's various verses that would, would help us along. Back to Psalms 119 and verse 9, it said, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word. Verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So we have help from the word. And not just help, but we find that the word gives us victory over sin. First John chapter 2, if I can get over here. First John chapter 2 verse 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And then in chapter 5 and verse 3 it says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. There's victory over sin because of the word. Victory over sin because of the word. You see, the word has promises that we can live right. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4, Whereby are given unto us these exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Promises one after another. The word, the word. By it we're convicted and converted and cleansed and challenged and chastened. We're fed and we're encouraged and we're satisfied and we're enlightened. It'll give us marital advice and parenting advice and financial advice and business advice and plain old-fashioned life advice. We're taught work ethic and how to evangelize and how to worship and how to pray. We learn conflict resolution and we learn that sometimes there is no resolution to conflict. The Word, it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. You know, today I am convinced that the promise of Haggai 2.9 is yet to be fulfilled. I think there are great days ahead for this church. But the secret, the secret is going to be found in your study of and adherence to the Word. We focus a lot in, in our churches, and rightly so, on being led by the Spirit. And this morning in Sunday school, we talked about uh, the, the, we have an unction from the Holy One and, and we know the truth because of him and, and how the Holy Spirit can cause us to discern. But you know, there's some things we don't have to pray about. They're already in the Bible. And there's some things we don't need to worry about what the Holy Spirit wants. He's already told us what he wants. It's in the Bible. And the secret to the future of this church is in your study of and adherence to the word. You say, Nathan, how do, you, how do you get so bold to say that? Acts chapter 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. 
And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scripture, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. Dropping now to verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Those at Thessalonica didn't look at scripture. They didn't read their Bible every day, and only some believed. Oh, yes, it talks about the Greeks and some of the chief women. But when he went to Berea, the Bible says many believed. And what was the difference of the quantity of the church growth? Nothing more than their desire for and appetite of the word. They read it. They studied it. They searched it daily. Daily. Why? Because they knew that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's got the secrets that we need for the path ahead. Let's stand.